Heavenly Father, we thank you for this another Lord's Day. We thank thee that this is day of all the week, the best and emblem of eternal rest. Christ is our Sabbath, and at the same time, he procures for us the ability to, by thy grace, keep the Sabbath, to set it apart as a special day unto thy service. We thank thee that thou hast um, set this day apart, not only for thy Self, not only for thy worship, but for the benefit of thy people. So we pray for thy church throughout all the world. We pray that the gospel would go forth uh, not um, in lofty words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Uh, we pray for this government of our country that we would continue to be allowed to proclaim uh, loudly and directly the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, um, and we pray that thou wouldst be with us, uh, especially this day, in a special way. Enlighten us, cause us to understand and believe the truth, because the truth shall make us free. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let us turn once again to Hebrews 11 and verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Last week we began looking at Hebrews eleven thirteen. Which is important because we said that, at least for our purposes, this is our working definition of a Christian. So, we must pay close attention to what the Apostle Paul says uh, concerning us. Here, this is what you are as a Christian. These all died in faith. Not having received the promises, which is to say the object of all the promises but having seen them afar off. In other words, they had not received the object of the promises physically. Christ had not yet come, but through faith they did, which is the entire point here. Having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. And so that is... Uh, a perfect description of what we are. Somebody's uh, mic needs to be muted. I still hear something coming through. Um, um, I've decided to entitle this week's message In Understanding Be Men, which is taken from uh, 1 Corinthians 14. Last week, our major emphasis was on the idea that the Christian life is one of perseverance. These all died in faith. They lived by faith and they died by faith. Which is to say um, that if you have faith, you're not going, it's not going to be taken away from you. You will not cease to have it. It will not run out, as it were. The Christian life is a life of perseverance and we don't persevere in driving our cars to church every week uh, or on pasting uh, the latest Christian cliche bumper sticker on our car or even in memorizing the Westminster Shorter Catechism as we've been doing on a weekly basis. We persevere in faith. Now don't get me wrong, a person who perseveres in faith, I believe, will want to memorize things such as the Westminster Shorter Catechism because this is an excellent summary of the gospel, of the object of our faith. In other words, we don't want to be like Roy Rogers uh, asking his horse Trigger, how old are you? And he goes, of course, he didn't know he was three years old. Uh... You see, my point is that we don't memorize something for the sake of memorizing it. We're, we're people created in the image of God. We have understanding. 
Um, now, to show once again the logic of the Christian faith, Paul begins with the saints' perseverance. These all died in faith. And we chose perseverance over preservation. Some people say that T-U-L-I-P, the P of tulip, uh, re represents a preservation rather than perseverance. We believe that it should be, as it has always been, perseverance. And the reason is that the Apostle Peter tells us we are preserved, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. In other words, God, preserve, God keeps us, God preserves us, but He preserves us in a certain manner, and the way of His preservation of us is through continuously granting us faith so that we persevere. Uh, the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul tells us to fight the good fight of faith. Same idea. We persevere through the faith or we are preserved through the faith which God gives us and we therefore fight the good fight of faith. And after telling us, once again to show the logic of the apostle, after telling us that we persevere through believing, he emphasizes the importance of understanding. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them. Our emphasis today is going to be on this word and this concept. Having seen them afar off. First of all, the necessity and the reality of the perseverance of the saints and then that, uh, the, the phenomenon, what it is that we persevere in. These all died in faith. They lived believing and they died believing, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. And uh, there is a sense, as we've said, there is a sense in which all men have faith. The natural man's faith ties him to the natural realm. The spiritual man's faith not only ties him to the spiritual realm, it delivers him, as we've seen again and again, from the natural realm. There is also a sense in which it is true to say that seeing is believing. Of course, the vast majority of times in which we hear this phrase, it means the exact opposite of what we mean. They mean that they will not believe unless they see with their natural uh, man's eyes something. Spiritual seeing is spiritual believing because seeing represents uh, regeneration. Psalm 119, 144 says, Give me understanding and I shall live. And the Holy Spirit grants us understanding that, th that we might believe the understanding that He grants us. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 14, the verse that we just mentioned. First Corinthians 14, 20. Brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. When's the last time you heard that verse read? <laughs> I, I, I couldn't remember. But it is extremely important. Um... Notice what Paul contrasts with understanding here. And this will amaze you if you're a child of our age. He contrasts understanding with malice. We, we tend to equate understanding with malice. But Paul contrasts the two. You think we might be slightly uh, at a slight dif distance away from the Apostle Paul? Remember the wickedest prayer, I told you this before, the wickedest prayer I ever heard in my life. Here's what the man said, word perfect. And Lord, deliver us from insistence on correct doctrine which leads to pride. You see that? What's my point? My point is, we in this age at least, we tend to equate understanding with malice. 
What, what's, the, what's the root of all malice? Maliciousness. And desiring to, to harm another person. What's the root of it? Pride. Deliver us from insistence on correct doctrine which leads to pride. You simply cannot be prideful and not hate other people. So Paul's contrast here is he contrasts understanding with malice. How so? Understanding is contrasted with malice because what's the first thing a person understands who's been given understanding? Remember uh, 1 Corinthians, that's another verse that all of us should have memorized, 1 Corinthians 1.30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us. What is Christ Jesus made unto us? The first thing on the list. Wisdom. And what is wisdom? What is the first thing that God grants you when he saves you? That's why uh, we read a couple weeks ago, Romans 3, verses 19 and 20. Now we know that whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Who have God has made unto us? Wisdom. The first thing you understand, and we read, I think it was last week, we read John Calvin's statement, uh, very insightful. He's asking which is first. First of all, he says the importance of understanding ourselves and the importance of understanding God, and which is the first. He says, in a sense, you can't understand yourself by, without at one and the same time understanding God. But to understand yourself, you must first and as soon as you understand who God is, you have a knowledge of your sinfulness which uh, prevents our being malicious toward other people. And so he contrasts, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 14, 20, he contrasts understanding with malice. Last week we just said, we began looking at Hebrews eleven thirteen. And this has for some time been our working definition of a Christian. Or you could say our working definition of a saint, our working definition of an elect, working definition of a sheep or of the beloved, but not of a Calvinist. Have you ever meditated on the fact? This is one reason, I think, why we've come up with this term Calvinism. To keep us from meditating on the fact that all of these monikers, all of these names, all of these appellations, all of these titles that God gives to a Christian. Christian, there's another one. Or full to the brim with spiritual significance. To be a saint is to have been set apart for God's purposes from the foundation of the world. Who has saved us. To be elect is to have been chosen in Christ from the foundation of the world who has saved us and called us with an holy calling. Not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. To be beloved means to have been the object of the love of God throughout all eternity. To be a sheep is to have been given by the Father to the Son from eternity. And it is impossible, says our Lord in John 10, to be plucked from the Father's hand. In short, all these monikers, all these titles, all these names that God gives to His people have one thing in common. Do you know what that is? They all have in common this one thing, and that is they all remove any and all ground for boasting. Whereas the term Calvinist, not going to spend much time on this, but I just want to hit it one more time. I'm convinced that the term Calvinist came about in order to place both Calvinists and Arminians on a continuum, saying that yes, both are Christians, but that we as Calvinists are intellectually superior to, other, to, to the Arminians. And what is that other than a ground for boasting? Because what it is it that a man 
takes pride in any more than his intellect. And so Hebrews 11, 13 is our working definition of a Christian. What are you? The apostle tells us right here what we are. We saw last week that this verse calls you a believer. These all died in faith. These all died believing. These all died believers. They lived believers and they died believers. And that's another title that God gives us. He calls us believers. These all died in faith means they all died believing something the not believing of which would have, according to Revelation 21.8, resulted in their eternal damnation. Let me say that again. They all, did, they all died believing something. The not believing of which would have resulted in their eternal damnation. Revelation 21.8. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second day, death. So the importance of being a believer. And we saw also that in accordance with John 8, 31 and 32, if you are a true believer, you will never become an unbeliever. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Notice he didn't say, if you continue in my word, then you will continue to be my disciples. Because that would mean if you, if you don't continue, then you stopped being my disciples. He's telling us that if you don't continue, you never were my disciples. If you believe, you continue believing. Our first point today is going to be this. Number one, apostasy. These all died in faith. If you have faith, you will die in faith. Apostasy is departure from the faith. So our first point is apostasy is real, but it is not individual. What did I just say? You will continue to believe if you believe. You cannot, there are no individual apostates. Churches become apostate, which is what we're facing at this very moment as we speak, but not individuals. Every true Christian perseveres in faith because faith is a product of regeneration. And since, as we said yesterday, God gave you faith, not because of anything you are or anything you do, but in spite of everything you were and everything you did. So it is inconceivable that he would take away the faith he gave you in spite of what you are, in spite of what you do. So there are no individual apostates. We need to get a hold of that. Get a grip on that. For you to have faith and then later become an unbeliever would mean for the immutable God to change his mind. And that's blasphemy. Apostasy is real, but it is not individual. And what a comfort that is to us who believe. Here's the definition of apostate. If you look it up in the dictionary. One who abandons a religious belief or principle. Well, what we just said was that this is impossible uh, for an individual to abandon a religious belief, uh, namely Christian faith. So how can we keep on using the term? And here's the answer. That is a term that needs to be used, apostate. In fact, John Owen wrote... Uh, a book on apostasy from the gospel. An apostate is a person who belongs to a group that has abandoned its religious beliefs. And how does this happen? To be forewarned is to be forearmed. Our forebears had this right, but we don't have it right. Basically, Christian apostasy occurs let me say that again. An apostate uh, 
is a person who belongs to a group that has a denomination, a church that has abandoned its religious beliefs. Basically, Christian apostasy occurs when a church or a denomination begins to de-emphasize the importance of children. Think about that. Isn't that what's happened? Notice I didn't say that apostasy occurs uh, when a denomination uh, begins to emphasize the importance of not having children. No, the devil never works like that. Ceases to emphasize the importance of children. Nobody's going to say you shouldn't have kids. Never heard it. For example, the way the devil works. In adultery, he doesn't want you to de-emphasize relations, just relations with your wife. In greed, he doesn't want you to de-emphasize your obligation. In the words of the Shorter Catechism, uh, for the procuring and furthering the wealth and outward estate of ourselves and others. He will try and convince you to live for money. So apostasy occurs with de-emphasis on children. And this, as with all aspects of truth, is perfectly logical. Even Whitney Houston knew this when she said, I believe that children are our future well, we believe that dogs are, apparently. And here's the logic of it. Listen, have you ever discovered how little pro Think of your own experience here. How little progress is ever made in personal evangelism. I've, let, I've quote, led a lot of people in praying uh, to receive or believe in Christ. And... In my view, they weren't Armenian prayers. But I cannot think of one of those people who persevered. What's my point here? Why is it that personal evangelism is, comparatively speaking, I'm not saying that nobody ever gets saved through personal evangelism. Far from it. But, I mean, considered as a whole, why is it that it's such a failure? I think the only answer is, that's not the way God set it up to work. And so, a de-emphasis on the family results to this uh, frightening apostasy that we are facing on a daily basis. And when we speak of personal evangelism, we're not talking about the guys at the football games holding up signs. They, if you talk to them, they're all, they all believe that God loves everybody. Jesus died for everybody. These people only make the, their proselytes twofold the children of hell than themselves. Once again, personal evangelism for the most part is a failure because that's not the way that God designed for His church to be built. What do we say? What did we say the personal, the Christian, the covenantal, which we uh, equate with Christianity. The covenantal pronoun, the Baptist pronoun is you. Uh, the covenantal pronoun is we. So apostasy is real but not individual because individual saints, as we saw last week, persevere to the end. The longer you're a Christian, the more you will see just how logical Christianity is. That's, what, that's one of the things that keeps us going. I mean, from my own personal experience, God causing me to see how logical, how rational, which is your reasonable service. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to everyone and then give you, ask if you a reason of the hope that is within you. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Oh, no, it's not rational according to uh, carnal understanding. There's nothing wrong with logic as, as long as it's God's logic, which we're not contrasting with mere, you hear this all the time, mere human logic. What is that? Opposed to dinosaur logic? Logic is logic. Man's, man's vision of multiplication 
as we've said before, is that you lead two people to Christ and then those two people in turn lead two people to Christ and so forth and so on. But it doesn't work. It never will work. It's not God's method of multiplication, multiplying His church. Because you can't, you can't lead two people to Christ. My, I, what's your experience? My experience shows it. God's vision of multiplication is through the family. You, we pray that God will open the womb and give us children. And then we catechize all the children that he gives us. This is God's way of blessing. And when we depart from this, we are no longer blessed but cursed. That's what we are. Look at all, the, all these women coming out of the woodwork everywhere. Telling us what we should do, what we should, how, how we should live, what we should believe. Such is the state of the church today. We have been saying that the promises referred to here are the one promise stated for the first time in Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, talking to Satan, and between thy seed and her seed. It, Satan has a seed. Have you meditated on that? It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. And then this one promise, this first promise, is repeated throughout the entire Old Testament. Which is that, number one, the, the Messiah was to come. And number two, the Messiah is to have a seed. Last week we spent a lot of our time talking about the phrase, having seen them afar off. Let's not forget that what we are talking about here is the definition of a Christian. A Christian is, according to this particular text, a, as we said again, as we said before, is a believer. These all died in faith, which is to say they all died believing. And the rest of the verse tells us what it is to have faith. What it is in which faith consists what it is to be a believer. And the first thing we saw last week was that a believer is one who sees the promises. Not so much who sees the promises, but who sees, as we said last week, because it's, it seems like this is what I, I think an, a good example of what they call a synecdoche. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. But from, from one particular standpoint, that's all they did receive was the promises. So it has to be talking about the object of all the promises, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, where we see in John 1, 14, and the Word became flesh. That is when we received the object of the promises that the Old Testament saints looked forward to. Looking, looking. Notice all these statements in Scripture. The importance of this. Not having received them, but having seen them afar off. Seen the object of the promise, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to these statements in Scripture. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He's the object of our faith. He's the author of our faith. He's the continuer of, as we just saw, being kept by the power of God through faith, through Him giving us faith. And the faith which the Father gives us is the faith which the Son procured for us. And is the faith which the Holy Spirit through the gospel works in us. Behold, having seen them afar off, John the Baptist says in John 1, 29, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. While we look, 2 Corinthians 4, 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. We look at the things which are not seen. The Lord Jesus Christ, the object of our faith. Hebrews 2, the same book, verse 9, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every. And next time you read Hebrews 2, 9, in the original, it is not, he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. The word man is added, which doesn't help us, by the way. He, 
that he by the grace of God should taste death for every, for every one of those who are being referred to in the text. So we see Jesus. Notice it says in every one of these instances that the object of our faith having seen them afar off, is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the word see here is capable of being misunderstood and so we want to spend some time here to prevent misunderstanding. Let's look at Romans 8, beginning with verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man said, why does he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience Wait for it. So you see, the word see here is contrasted with the very thing we're talking about. Uh, it's contrasted with the idea of having seen them afar off in our text in Hebrews eleven thirteen, The word see in Romans 8, 24 means the same thing as sight in 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We walk by faith, not by sight. To see in Romans 8.24 is a physical perception, is perception in the natural realm. We are saved by hope. You see, it's the opposite. Our hope, according to Hebrews 11.13, is in seeing Christ. But he said, we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. Uh, for what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? And as, once again, we, we were speaking of a few minutes ago, faith in the natural realm ties you to the natural realm. Faith in the spiritual realm ties us to the spiritual realm and delivers us from the natural realm. And the faith that God gives us is called here hope because the, the Christian hope is a certainty. Nobody else knows that. You, you might as well be talking Swahili if you're talking to an unregenerate person about hope. Because, once again, if you have spiritual faith, God, God, God doesn't give you faith to doubt. Faith is the opposite of doubt. It's a certainty. We talked about it yesterday. How do you know that you have faith? We'll speak of that further in a few minutes, but what is it? Are you sure that you have faith? What do you believe? Are you, are you a miracle? Look around you. Look at what people are talking about. Look at the fact that you are unable to communicate with a vast majority of these people. Why? This, is, this ought to encourage us at the time when we see when we're in a vast major, minority and yet we're greatly encouraged because we see that we could not... We could not possibly believe ourselves to be utterly indisposed to all good, utterly disabled to all good, made opposite to all good, and wholly inclined to all evil, unless God gave us that understanding and belief. We see, in having seen them afar off, refers to the same thing we see in Philippians 3.12. So that we can see the importance of this concept of seeing in a spiritual sense. Philippians 3.12 says what? Not as though I had already attained, neither were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. You see that? Same exact concept. Apprehension. The police officer apprehended the suspect. We apprehend the object of our faith. 
Not a physical perception, but a spiritual apprehension, which takes us back to the idea that, yes, the natural man has faith, but his faith ties him to this physical realm. And the spiritual man's faith ties him to the spiritual realm. We look not at the things which are seen, the Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 4. And we said that this verb, look, is translated. This is so interesting. I hope you've gotten this already. This word look, where he says we look not, the same verb, is translated in Colossians 3, 2, where he says, set your affections on things above, the exact same verb. We look not at, but we look at the things which are not seen. We set our affections on things above because we're delivered from the natural realm. Not on things on the earth. You see the antithesis. If your affection is on things on the earth, then your affection isn't on things above. Good test, isn't it? We talked about this yesterday as well. Yeah, I need a bigger... Oh, you need a bigger house. You need a faster car. You need a more expensive car. You need a... Whatever it is. Set your affections. We look at the things which are above. The principle of antithesis. Trust in the Lord, once again. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Very precious promise to the Christian. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. He that trusts his heart, Proverbs tells us, is a fool. For to be carnally minded, Paul says in Romans 8, is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And according to Hebrews 11, 13, spiritual mindedness is to see Christ as everything. But as we said last week, faith has an objective aspect, which is Christ, but it also has a subjective aspect, which is believing something about yourself. When we believe in Christ, we're not simply believing in a man who fulfilled prophecy, that he was born in Bethlehem. That's a good question to ask people. When a person believes in Christ, what does he believe? What does he believe about Christ? That makes him a Christian. We call him a believer. He believes in Jesus. What does he believe about Jesus? It makes him a Christian. You can believe that Christ was born in Bethlehem. You can believe that he performed miracles. You can believe that he even walked on water. And not be a Christian. When we believe in Christ, when we say that a person believes in Christ, what we mean is that he believes that Christ has something that we don't have, but that something is demanded of us. We don't have. He has something which we do not have, but the not having is demanded, which God demands of us that we have none of. And that is Christ's perfect righteousness. The subjective aspect of faith is belief in total depravity, having zero of that righteousness that God demands of us. And then seeing this righteousness all in Christ. And Christ on the cross not only paid the penalty for all his people's transgressions, all the people who see themselves as being totally depraved, what is the definition of sin in the Westminster Shorter Academy? We're coming up on that very quickly. Sin is any want of... Con Notice that they divide sin into two parts. What is sin? Sin is any want of conformity unto or transgression of the law of God. Christ died for our transgressions, which is to say that we have from birth done those things which we ought not to have done. But then secondly, and the thing that you, that, which is passed over almost uh, across the board nowadays is very seldom pointed out that the work of Christ, they used to say, they used to refer to it as Christ's active and passive uh, righteousness. But there's no such thing as passive righteousness. What they meant by that was uh, that Christ died on the cross to pay for our transgressions. And then the other thing uh, 
concerning the work of Christ is that he worked out a perfect righteousness on our behalf, which is imputed to us through faith. So we have sins, the, the catechism tells us, sins of commission, which are dealt with by the death of Christ on the cross. And we have sins of omission, which Matthew 5.18 tells us, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Fulfilled by whom? Fulfilled by Christ. Having seen the promises afar off means seeing that God has promised to make us something that we are not. Because apart from God making us what we are not in Christ, we are damned. And then before we go to the second aspect of what it means to be a Christian, we want to say this. Everything, and this is one of our main emphasis today, everything in the Christian life is predicated on understanding. i say that again. Having seen them afar off. Look at all these statements. We just mentioned some of them in the Scripture regarding the importance of understanding. But we see Jesus looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We look not at the things which are seen, but we look at the things which are not seen. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. The, everything in the Christian life is predicated on understanding. Having seen them afar off, Colossians 2.6 says. Let's look at that. Colossians 2.6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Or Psalm 119.34. Give me understanding, and I shall keep. The, thy law, yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Or said in a more concise way, and in Psalm 119, 144, give me understanding and I shall live. Or here's another way of stating this. You've probably heard it before, maybe you haven't. The indicative precedes the imperative. Indicatives in Scripture precede imperatives. That's what we've been talking about uh, over the last few months concerning the way the epistles, uh, for the most part, uh, are constructed. The first half is doctrine. The second half is practice. Uh, the first half is faith, what we believe. The second half is life. And we said that the word that comes between the two is therefore, which which only means what we're saying right now, and that is with regard to indicatives and imperatives. An indicative is a statement. It's a description. It's an assertion. An imperative is a command. You've got to get those things. If you get those things confused, you're a heathen. The false gospel is do, 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 imperative. The true gospel is done. There it is. Indicative. You were. We're talking about understanding here. Everything in the Christian life is predicated upon understanding. Indicatives. You were totally depraved. Indicative. The Father chose you from the foundation of the world. Indicative. The Son comes and procures through His death and perfect righteousness the salvation which the Father has chosen you to inherit. Indicative. The Spirit comes and applies to us the redemption purchased by Christ. Shorter Catechism. How are we made partakers of the redemption purchased by Christ? We are made partakers of the redemption purchased by Christ by the effectual application of it to us by His Holy Spirit. The Father chooses unconditionally because you can meet no conditions. The Son comes and procures. This. Notice, these are all indicatives. These are all statements. These are all assertions. These are all the first half of the, the epistles. 
You think they're wasting? You think the Apostle Paul is wasting time in the first half of his epistles? No. He's laying the, the groundwork in indicatives. The Son comes and procures the salvation of all that the Father has elected unconditionally. The Spirit comes and applies this salvation to all the Father has elected and to all the Son has redeemed. And then and only then do we have imperatives. As ye have therefore, going back to the verse we just read, Colossians 2, 6, I love that passage. As ye have therefore, there's therefore again, receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, imperative. Or to use the verse I hope you've already memorized, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Purge out. There's an imperative. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump. And it doesn't stop there. It was it? As ye are unleavened. Stated in another way. Since you are unleavened. Think, think about this constantly. You are Objectively speaking, you are as perfect as perfect can be. That's what he's getting at here. Since you are, objectively speaking, speaking, uh, unleavened, purge out, therefore the old leaven, that ye may be what you are. You see, the imperative follows the indicatives of the gospel. Once again, everything in the Christian life is predicated on understanding. That's why we don't have it now, right? That's why nobody's emphasizing understanding because it's so important. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding because your understanding is, and that is misunderstanding. And that once again, that's the importance of understanding. Because everything, we mentioned this before too. Everything that you, from the time you were born, meditate on this, from the time you were born, every thought you ever had about God was completely wrong. Our understanding is misunderstanding. Or put it in a slightly different way. Paul says in Romans 10, 1 and 2. My heart's desire, he says, in prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. What's he calling them? He's calling them apostate. Not individual apostasy. But the people of God have become apostate. Apostate, just as it has happened 500 years ago. My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record. That they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. And if you look that word up for knowledge, it means a precise knowledge. How many people are going to believe this? Unless you have a precise understanding of the gospel, you're not a Christian. Now, of course, as soon as we say every Christian has a precise understanding of the gospel, our enemies are going to say what? Nobody has perfect doctrine. No, did I just say anyone has perfect do doctrine? No. Does the scripture say anybody has perfect doctrine? No. Does the scripture say that every single Christian has a precise understanding of the gospel? Yes. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. True zeal. They have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. True zeal. See, zeal is neutral. It's neither good. A zealous person can either be very uh, productive or very counterproductive. True zeal is based on understanding. Everything in the Christian life is predicated on understanding. And the word here for understanding, we said in the text, means precise. Understanding. Some of you have wondered aloud. Well, I hope you have. And I, I've heard some feedback. 
on this. You've wondered aloud, when did I become a Christian? And here's the answer. As soon as you had a clear understanding, a clear understanding of justification by faith. Not before then. Well, I believe that a person, uh, uh, that, that everyone begins the Christian life as an Arminian. Well, then you're an unbeliever. God says otherwise. Because an Arminian doesn't have, not only does he not have a precise understanding, of it, he does, his, his entire understanding is misunderstanding. So, when did you become a Christian? When you had an understanding, a clear understanding of justification by faith. You understood and believed in total depravity. And then you understood, therefore, that your only hope was in Christ's righteousness. And last but not least, you understood that the relationship between faith and justification, what the relationship was between faith and justification. That's when you were a Christian. Justification is an act. That's why these definitions are so important. I remember uh, attending a PCA church and this guy was totally messed up. Uh, and so in front of the associate pastor, I quoted, what is justification? It is an act of God's free grace wherein he pardoneth all our sins and accepts us as righteous in his sight only for the righteousness of Christ imputed us and received by faith alone. I look, looked at the associate pastor. Have you got a better definition of justification? <laughs> he couldn't give me one, but, though he didn't believe in it. Both the true gospel and the false gospel hold to the necessity of faith to salvation. But you're not a Christian unless you understand the relationship of faith to salvation. You're not going to talk to an evangelical. Ask him, does a person need to believe in Jesus to be a Christian? They're all going to say yes. So, the similarity between the true gospel and the false gospel is that both the true gospel and the false gospel hold to the necessity of faith to salvation. And the difference is the relationship between faith and salvation. You're not a Christian if you don't understand the relationship between faith and salvation. And the false gospel holds that the relationship is that God accepts you on the basis that you believe. That's the only thing I was ever taught in the Southern Baptist Church. Never heard anybody else, and every single person I was raised with believed that. Faith is the meritorious cause of justification. God accepts you on the basis of your faith. Did anyone in the did anyone did I ever hear anyone in the Southern Baptist Church say that faith is the meritorious ground of justification? No, because they're too ignorant to come up with that. Somebody like John Wesley had to come up with that. God accepts our faith. There, you, Here's the statement of it. Here's the theological statement of what I was raised to believe. God accepts your faith instead of perfect righteousness. God, God plays head games. He knows your faith isn't perfect righteousness, but he accepts your faith as if it were. That's blasphemy. Precise understanding. Everything in the Christian life is predicated on understanding. Every true Christian understands the, the relationship between it, that's the false understanding the true what's the what's the biblical understanding of the relationship between faith and understanding it is this through the faith which the Holy Spirit works in you Christ's perfect righteousness is imputed to you so now faith is not the meritorious ground of our justification it's Christ's righteousness Christ merited our justification. Faith is the instrumental cause. God accepts us through the faith which the Holy Spirit works in us. Once again, Hebrews 11.13 tells us that everything in the Christian life is predicated on understanding. Having seen Him afar off. Having seen Him how much does this person understand about the Lord Jesus Christ? There it is. This is why we're opposed to gory pictures of Christ in the narthex. Pictures of Christ not only do not aid our understanding of Christ, but they inhibit it. Right? See? See what I'm saying? Having seen him afar. This is spiritual understanding. 
A spiritual concept. What was that? Uh, we, we spent about three or four sermons. You might want to go, some of you who recently in the past few months joined us, you might want to go back and look at these sermons we, we preached. I think about three or four sermons on the beatific vision. There it is. That's what we're talking about. Everything in the Christian life is predicated on understanding. Predicated on the beatific vision. When's the, when's the last time you heard about the beatific vision? That's the only thing we're re- that we're really talking about. But we see Jesus. To see Christ is to see everything. And to have... Go- I mean, it's inconceivable to have gory pictures in a narthex of Christ. Because it inhibits your understanding of Christ. Lastly, and negatively speaking, the primary reason we emphasize understanding is that God emphasizes it. But negatively speaking, our greatest enemies oppose it. Meditate on this. That's why they say the first thing that comes out of their mouth, nobody has perfect understanding. They, our enemies, promote obfuscation, not understanding. They say that total depravity is a very misleading term. They don't want you to understand it. They say that here in Tulip, uh, that, that uh, what do they call it? Ac- acrostics. Did you ever hear him say, make this statement? acrostics and they're talking about TULIP T-U-L-I-P sometimes do more harm than good they say that not only is total depravity misleading but many if not all the other points are misleading as well total depravity doesn't mean that man is as bad as he can be and this has this teaching has been going on I've discovered it's been, this has been going on for over a hundred years they've been talking like this. And the big guys, not the little guys, they say that God only loves His elect soteriologically. But He also has a soteriological love for the reprobate owing to common grace which makes him spiritually better than he was before. If a man isn't as, as bad as he can be, then he has some goodness. If he has goodness, God has to love him. They say that Christ died only for those that the Father gave Him, but He is dead for every man. They say that the Holy Spirit regenerates only those that the Father elected and the Son redeemed. But the Holy Spirit will regenerate you too if only you will believe. And common grace gives you the ability to do that. And then lastly, they say that perseverance is synergistic. You are finally saved because of your cooperation. Eternity will not be long enough for God to thank you for the part you played in your sanctification. God's going to tell you, He would have to tell you, I couldn't have done it without you when you get to heaven. What blasphemy. That's our opponents. Obfuscation, not understanding. And let's not leave out That not only going back to 1 Corinthians 14, 20, what do we say? Not only does he say, in understanding, be not children in understanding. That's a command based on the indicative of of who you are. Be not children in understanding, albeit in malice be ye children. But in understanding, then he comes right back with it. But in understanding, be men. But in malice, he says, be children. I'll close with one of the stupidest statements, spiritually speaking, I ever heard in my entire life. Coming from the associate pastor of perhaps the most influential PCA church in the 20th century. Perhaps the stupidest, spiritually speaking, statement I ever heard in my life. Listen to this. I asked this associate pastor, he was good friends with my family. We were eating lunch uh, one day together. I asked him this question. I said, Bob, 
Are these two Jesuses the same? The Jesus who comes and procures the salvation of all that the Father gave him. And the Jesus who comes and procures the salvation of no man, but merely makes the salvation of all men possible. I said, are these two Jesuses the same? His answer, when it, word for word answer, when it, forget your theology and love people. You see the relationship? In understanding, be men. In malice, be children. Under, in our age, understanding is thought to be... Did you get his statement? My understanding, the understanding, to understand and distinguish and insist on 2 Second, Second John 9, which is to say, 2 John 9, uh, let's look at it, I'm drawing a blank. 2 John 9, you know you're getting old when you can understand the, the concept and you forget the words. 2 John 9, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. There it is. So, to understand and insist on the doctrine of Christ to this man is to be full of malice. Forget your theology and love people. But this man, does it come to surprise to you that every person, almost every person I ever knew who knew this man, the first thing they thought about this man is he was such a loving person. But he was a violent, malicious person. Because what? He was, in understanding, a child. Everything in the Christian life, Paul tells us, is predicated on understanding. Let me give one last illustration of this. Um, just to show how serious this problem is. I recently mentioned uh, the fact that the leader of present-day antinomians, sovereign grace antinomians, the leader of leaders of this group, said, I heard I couldn't, somebody put, his, put this sermon up, and I clicked on it and listened to the first five or ten minutes of it. He made that the leader, the head of the modern-day sovereign grace antinomians said, my favorite preacher is Spurgeon. And so I put that up and this guy responds. He says, who is this man? I won't say his name. Who is John Doe? And I said, have you been living under a rock? And he responds by saying this, don't cut my head off. Hello, come on. Cut your head off. I'm saying, we're in a war and you don't even know who the enemy is. Wake up. That's not cutting your head off. Might sound like it in this age in which is it any, is it any amazement to us that it's constantly hearing this, um, this term bullying. Yeah, you're being a bully. No, I'm telling you, you have to know these things. You have to know who our greatest enemies are. You have to know this is a contradiction for him to make this statement the head of the Sovereign Grace Antinomians, to say his favorite, uh, uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon represents the opposite of everything that the Sovereign Grace Antinomians superficially stand for. That's an indictment. So, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. This is a blessed uh, cycle. We've heard of vicious cycles. But this is the blessed. The more you understand about Christ, the more you want to understand about Christ. And the more you want to understand about Christ, the more that you understand about Christ. Throughout all eternity, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this another Lord's Day that Thou hast given us. We thank Thee that Thou hast given us. And have given, the Son of God has come and has given us not only eternal life, has given us an understanding that we might know Him that is true. 
And we are in Him and in His truth. Even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Amen.